If you know her, just say hi, Adele. And we have Mr. Craig Fortain, and he is a teacher at uh, Parklands College, and he teaches economics and EMS. Hi, Craig. And then we have Mr. Ivan Papir, who has been seconded to a Winelands as an e-learning advisor. And where is Ivan? <laughs> There you are. Hi, nice to see you. And then we have Mr. Jakub van Niekerk. He is our um, DCS for capacity building. And Mr. Lyndon Hunter, he teaches everything on the planet. Afrikaans, home language, technology, creative arts, and natural <laughs> science from Claremont Primary School. And then lastly, we have Ms. Natasha Fry. And she teaches natural science and life science at Fairmount Secondary School. So welcome, everybody. You can just unmute yourselves. This is not just me talking the whole day. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So, hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. So today we are not going to be having. We're not going to be having a traditional panel discussion. Our panelists will be able to share their screens with you at any point if they feel necessary to explain a concept, an idea, something that they do in their school. Uh, and they will keep their cameras on the entire time. So you're going to have to get used to their lovely faces. Um, so when thinking about formative assessment, I went onto the DBE website. And I found what they think a formative assessment is, and we're going to see if we are on the right track here, Western Province. So the DBE describes assessment for learning as the process of gathering information about a learner's learning from a variety of sources using a variety of approaches or assessment tools and interpreting that evidence to both enable the teacher and the learner to determine where the learner, whether the learner in is learning, where the learner needs to go and how best to get there. Teachers can adjust instructional strategies, resources and the environments effectively to help all learning to achieve uh, great specific outcomes only if they have accurate and reliable information about what their learners know and are able to do at a given time. So let's see if we are on the right track. <laughs> Mr. Linden, what, do you, what role do you think assessment for learning should play in education? And is it currently happening? Yeah, um, you, you start with me. No? Okay. Of course. <laughs> um, for me, it is a very crucial part of getting the learners to develop in the education system. It focuses on the assessment to inform and improve the learning process. And for me, it is also a primary purpose to provide ongoing feedback to both students and myself as an educator, other educators. So for, for, for us, um, for me to help them understand where students stand in their learning journey and um, guiding instructional decisions. So. From from that point of view, yeah, um, that is basically the the primary. It's a base for me for learners to get um, primarily developed so that we can get to summative assessment. I love that. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, Natasha, how do you currently incorporate formative assessment, assessment for learning in your classroom, and what positive outcomes have you seen so far? Hi guys, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. So thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> kids are into technology by nature. Um, they're born with cell phones in their hands, some say. And so I've tried to incorporate that into, into my life sciences lessons. Um, you know, people think that just that, 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 that computer science and cat and, I, and, and, and IT is the only space in one can use those digital devices. So we've used um, a fold scope. A fold scope is a little micro microscope that fits into a pencil bag, and it has the exact same magnification 
um, of a normal um, uh, microscope that we have in the classrooms. Many schools can't afford those ones or they get stolen. And so the foldscope goes to the pencil bag um, and the lens has the same magnification. But the exciting part is the kids are able to, get a, to attach it to their cell phones. So now instead of standing in front of the classroom and showing them sketches of what a plant cell looks like under a microscope, they go and discover for themselves. And so as opposed to then saying, here's a worksheet, um, draw what a plant cell looks like, all they're doing is repeating what they've seen in the textbook of what you've drawn on the board. But with a full scope, when they're looking under the microscope and they're attaching their cell phones to it and they're nifty with their cell phones, they can zoom in and out, they know how to crop, they can even screenshot it and then save the picture. So they find out for themselves what a plant or animal saw. And even things like they started getting like really excited. So they would start collecting all sorts of stuff like feathers lying around or fly wings and stuff. And then I would ask them to scare the saw. So it's things that they discovered themselves and that could be a practical assessment. Um, wow. So it's one of the, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I've never heard about a fold scope before. I've just been way after my time and being at school, I'm assuming. <laughs> Craig, I know that you really love using technology in your classroom. So let's talk about how you do that for your assessment and especially for formative assessment and the learner's academic growth in your classroom. Right, yes. Thanks, thanks, Melissa. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to know that there's so many people listening in this afternoon. Um, 200, 242. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. So hopefully 240 people's lives are going to be changed this afternoon after they've heard what, what we're saying. So, yeah, you know, without a doubt, the daily use of formative. So I, I use a platform called Formative. Um, it used to be called Go Formative. Um, and it's it's really enhanced engagement in my subject. So, you know, the incredible versatility of the platform in terms of what you can ask, how you can ask it, when you want to ask it, is, is just astounding. You know, the, the flexibility with regard to acceptance of responses, the ability to provide meaningful feedback easily to every individual is, is what makes the platform form amazing. Uh, you know, I've, I've tried various things and there's nothing quite like this. Um, so yeah, you know, I've, I follow a traditional method of, of teaching content. I teach economics, and and then you know, I give I give the learners an online worksheet. I call it a worksheet, on formative for most of the topic we cover, and and that's done as a student-paced activity. So each learner can work at their own pace. Um, and and then you know, when I'm explaining calculations or some sort of content that um, that requires solid foundational knowledge before you move on to the next um, you know, part of the work, in order to make sure I know everyone's on board, then I issue the worksheet as a, as a teacher-paced activity, which means that I can slow release one question at a time. And then because I'm getting responses in real feed, sorry, in real time, I, I can ensure that everybody's getting the question right before I move on to, on to the next you know, uh, part of the work. So this is great because you know, traditionally in a classroom, one one will ask a question, and then you sort of look around, and you know, some people are hoping that that you're not going to catch their eye, and typically you get you know the same learner or the same two or three learners answering every time, and and others don't. Whereas with with this you know system that I'm using, it's great because I get to ask everyone the question, and everyone must actually answer, not just the usual people. So yeah, that's it's it's made a big difference to the way I teach. Thank you for that, Craig. Uh, yes, Yaku. Um, I just wanted to to come in there. Something critical that that <clears throat> I think we 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 sometimes forget. Um, formative assessment is really supposed to form the basis of our assessment for the most part and if we if we are realistically looking at what we are doing in our classrooms and we listen to what craig just spoke about the ability to actually test every single thing that we're teaching to determine whether or not learners are keeping track because that's what formative assessment is about um and we specifically we we, we spoke about the concept assessment for learning as opposed to just assessment of learning because I think we get stuck in that point. We are so focused on the test, the project, the exam. That's what it's all about. 
And it's very unfair if you think about it, because what we're supposed to be doing, I often talk about the feedback loop. We are supposed to first teach content. Then we assess whether or, learn, whether or not learners have learned the content. We give them feedback on it. And then we go and actually identify the missing gaps. But so often what we end up doing is we teach content. Then we test content. Then it takes us two weeks or so to mark the content. By the time the learner finds out what they got wrong, we've just moved on to the next content and we have not had time to actually go and adjust. So I think it's, I, I, I want us to just for a second, think about what Craig is saying. He teaches something, then he tests whether or not they know what's going on. There's another step, but I'll talk about that a little bit. I think we'll, I'll touch on that later with one of the questions, but he actually tests whether or not they understand because then he knows immediately who knows what's going on. That whole idea of we are now we're sitting with the seven panelists. If I ask a question of the six other of my six, well, the, the, my five fellow panelists, one of them, Adele's already got a hand raised. I see that. Um, will raise their hand and answer the question. I have no idea whether or not the others know what's going on. And that's what we do. We teach a lesson. We ask the kids, everyone understand who's going to raise their hand and say, no, sir, I've got no idea what's going on. Please reteach everything. No one wants to look like that, that kid in the class. And we've always got that one guy who wants to raise his hand and answer all the questions, which is what I'm going to give Adele the opportunity to do now. Yes, Adele. Adele you, is um, um, a teacher from Sharif Water School, who has now moved into the inclusive education space at the CTLI. So she has lots of experience in inclusive education. Yay! I'm moving along. So just to latch on to what, um, what Craig and Yaku said, I think it's important. I mean, we are looking at the digital form of assessment and how we can do that formative. And it's, and it's important um, that what we what tool we use for the formative assessment, if you're going to use that for assessment, for summative assessment, make sure that you use the same tool. Don't introduce the learner to a new tool because then what are you actually assessing at the end of the day? We're assessing content. OK, so I just wanted to latch on with that. For me, it's important that you take the learner on a trajectory using the same tool because you are testing content at the, at the time. Okay, so we are just to, to bring it back to the digital form and, and how we can um, involve that when we are teaching for the learners. So the learner is not shocked because, you know, when, when the subject advisors come to our, our class, we want to show them what we're doing. But then the learners never got an exposure using the tool and you just stand there like, answer answer but we need to make it part of our lesson um because that is where we can see the gaps and this is how as as the panelists today we want to make it easier for you we want to work smarter using um apps that can utilize in classroom for formative assessment so i just wanted to touch on on that Thank you, Adele. And I think if you have ever been uh, privileged to listen to Mr. Craig speak, his learners are so in the routine. Yaku and I were talking about routines this morning. Where his learners are in a routine. They know what's going to happen. They know he's going to use formative. They know that he's going to give them different activities because he's made them. It's part of their classroom structure. And I think as learners, they also need that routine before you introduce something new, before you do something completely insane, get them into the routine. Yes, Lyndon, you can yeah. join us. Yeah, I, I just want to say, and I, I agree with Adele as well. Um, at our school, we started um, last year with um, green suits, uh, mathematics, and we started for grade four to seven, but that was just... Um, formal assessment and from this year onwards our district um i think we are a pilot school um gave us that opportunity <clears throat> to do our summative assessment and at the start of the year we had that problem of resources and we have a small lab only 20 mini pieces and we said um our learners are going to be assessed via the platform of um Green suit. So we have to give them the opportunity to do the formal assessment. So we pushed and, and for now our lab is on.
only running so that we can get um, those classes, grade four to seven classes, equipped those learners, equipped and involved in um, being taught in um, using mini PCs and getting that. So they, they do get now the um, two times a week for one hour each class. Um, they do get the formal assessment and then also for homework, um, they do get the formal everything for preparation for the formal for the summative assessment. So yeah, so it is like that learners need to know the um, technology before we can assess them on it. Thank you so much, uh, Lyndon. Um, Craig, there's a message for you in the chat. And then somebody also said, we are too focused on delivering content. Yes, we focus on covering the whole curriculum and don't realize if learning was taking place while you were teaching. Back to learner-centered teaching. I love it. Yaku? Um, just one last comment on the 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 idea of of getting used to the technology i think we we make the sometimes we make the mistake that learners are going to be super comfortable with all technology from day one and then we try something new with them it doesn't quite work and then we don't kind of we don't want to stick to it and it's exactly as as lyndon has pointed out now if your learners are going to have to do summative assessments on mco it would be incredibly unfair to get them to have to write that and never have experienced MCO before that. It's the same idea as saying learners are allowed to use calculators in an exam, but we will never show them what a calculator looks like mm -hmm. before the exam. I mean, that yeah. everyone understands that ma that's madness. Mm -hmm. So no one does that. But we sometimes we we kind of do that with with technology. We we want to introduce technology to them now and expect it to work from day one um, without realizing that there's a learning curve in technology and what's great about it is we are teachers we're all about learning so there's nothing wrong with there being a learning curve in the use of technology because you're still making sure that kids learn so i think that's a critical thing when it comes to formative assessment is that finding th something sticking to it and being willing to realize that it's not going to work 100 percent on day one but give it time and it becomes part of that routine that regular thing that they know is happening. And then you'll see there's an enormous difference in what you're able to do. I always tell my uh, teachers when I visit schools, uh, it will be terrible the first time and maybe the second time and the ninth time. It will be fantastic. It will be great because the, now the learners understand and it's not a shock to them. They have to know content and the digital tool at the same time. Yes, Greg? Hi, ah, yes, uh, you, you know, uh, just I agree 100% with, with what you've said there. I, my journey with formative started, you know, six or seven years ago, and literally at, I started by just doing sort of, you know, four or five questions in, in a lesson. And, you know, I experimented with everything that formative could do, the different ways you could ask questions, you know, different content you could put in, till I got to, to the point where I was really feeling so confident that I knew how to use it, my learners knew exactly how to use it, that now we're doing full scale exams at Parklands on uh, using formative as the platform grade seven EMS exam. The entire thing is, is done on formative. There's not a piece of paper in sight. The learners have calculations to do the case studies they have to respond to, etc. Um, and, and, you know, I tell my colleagues here at Parklands as well, don't let the first time you use formative in an, if the, the first time you use formative, it's it's in an exam. You need to have actually experimented with it in your class so that you know what you're doing and you know what your limitations, et cetera, are and, and you know how to get around any problems and pitfalls. So that's that's what my advice to people is is get confident with what you're using. Thank you so much for that. Now, if we may just ask Mr. Evan a question because he is so extremely quiet today for some reason. <laughs> Putting Evan, me on the spot, eh? <laughs> yes, of course. What are some of the creative ways you have used some technology tools to conduct formative assessment um, assessment for learning in your classroom? And can you give us a little bit of context without going too deep yet? <laughs> OK, so um, because um, the school that I'm teaching at is a Quantel one school and um, 
we do have quite a few uh, technology, um, but 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 I think just like the other panelists just talked about is really getting the learners used to uh, using the technology. So I used some um, low tech um, options and I, I quickly just want to, Melissa, if I may, can I share? Of course. My, okay, <laughs> so I'll just quickly share. I'll just quickly share my screen. Um, and these are a few. Uh, these are the options that I had available because my learners, um, they don't have devices at home. Um, the, the most, uh, the one that I should actually started with was um, WhatsApp. Um, and then this one really helped me quite a lot to do some formative assessment. This was done mainly through um, screen in COVID, um, I used WhatsApp and then I, when they became more comfortable in the space and became more confident, I moved on to Google Forms and then later on at school we did Kahoots and then later on they, we, we, we went to Nearpod. Um, but just to quickly share, um, I quickly just want to um, see what we've done. I want to show you an example of, of exactly what we've done in, um... in the this. Sorry, Evan. Can you hear uh, me? We, oh, okay. Yes. Never mind. You may continue. You? I thought you were actually okay. looking at your WhatsApp chats right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, 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 can you see the snippets? The yes, screenshots? you can see it. Yes. Okay. So, so, so what I've done was I created, I created the, 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 the classroom. Um, and then I gave them instructions to, to, I gave them some content and then I asked them to now tell me what they understand about um, about the, the topic. And I know it's in Afrikaans now, but I asked them to give it back to me in different ways. They can give it to me in text or they can give it to me in pictures or in videos. And this is what they've actually done. This is real examples of what they've actually, this is their way of giving back to me. And this is how I knew, okay, so they really understand the topic or I had to go back with some learners' feedback within the with, within the um, in the chat um, and how to consolidate that a bit more. So, like I said, then I went on to um, Google Forms, um, and this is a, a picture of one of my Gate Eight learners who, like you said, one of the panelists panelists also said, you know, be, uh, you're having a traditional way of doing it and then go with digitizing that. Um, so he was sitting with with one of his um, worksheets, and then gradually we moved from from that using the worksheet, and then um, doing it in on Google Form just to get used to uh, doing it in that way. I, I love the examples, and I love that your learners. And firstly, understood your question because you gave them a, a question that made sense. It wasn't vague. Mm. They didn't have to. Um, decipher your 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 uh, language or anything, and I think that's more very important. Yaku and I talk about how some teachers try to trick learners by proving that they are smarter than them by asking them trick questions when mm. that is just not needed at all. We're trying to test mm. their learning, what they have learned, not to prove that we are smarter than them in any way. So yeah. I like that as well. And I like the fact that you you may have a, gr a gradual transition to the more challenging mm. um, tools. So that's really nice. And Natasha, do you have any other uh, creative ways that you've used digital tools in your classroom? I was um, <clears throat> listening to Evan and I thought, oh, well, let's just let's just end the presentation right there. <laughs> Um, a lot of uh, similar things. I mean, WhatsApp was the go-to during um, lockdown, um, and, and and so we, we continue to use that. But the kids are quick on it. Um, the Google Forms as well works wonders. We've also done um, similar, and then the Kahoot. The kids love that, so we do it. The Kahoot as an um, end of week activity. You know, let's get into teams, and I try to make it more fun and interactive, but. They don't realize just how much they're recalling um, of what happened in the week. And mm -hmm. so it's that equal in a fun space. Um, also, once again, you know, in, in making learning um, fun. So, yeah, pretty much everything we said, Evan. So thanks for the, the shared power. Thanks, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, Yaku, I see you are in deep thought there. So can you, in short, tell us how are we going to foster a collaborative and supportive learning environment through technology-based formative assessment activities and encouraging learner participation and engagement? How can we do that? <laughs> well, that's such an easy question. Thanks. So Melissa. easy. <laughs> so easy. Now, for me, one of the critical things is the the, the, the concept of, of active learner engagement. There's, there's just simply too much, and, and um, I'm fortunate enough to get to visit a number of schools um, and see what is happening across our province. And one of the things that, that I feel we are still very much stuck in, and this is due to no fault of anyone specific, is we have a lot of passive learners. We have learners that are sitting and waiting to waiting to receive information, waiting to receive instruction. Um, they're waiting to, I mean, if they do an assessment, they're waiting to find out that they get it right. They go home, they do homework, and then they come to the school the next day to find out, did I get the homework right? I don't know. And it's if you think about it, there are so many elements to it that, that actually just don't make sense. You ask them question one, and question two builds on question one, but they don't know if they got question one right. So what are they building on? They're building on faulty knowledge. They're building on 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 things that aren't working. So um, I think one of the most challenging parts for us to get to is that collaborative thing, the 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 shared learning experience that you're talking about. So so I, I my my honest view is is if you're going to go for that first, you might fall flat on your face. What we first need to get to is a point where we get active learning, where learners are taking ownership of their own learning experience. Because once that starts happening, once learners start taking ownership of their learning experience, then we get to the point where they might start becoming more willing to share their learning experience, where they start saying, but you know what? Because at the moment, let's face it, kids are scared that they're getting things wrong. If if you're not sure that you're right, why would you then put your hand up and support other learners that if you don't have the confidence to know that that you're right in that moment. So in that sense, to bring it back to formative assessment and digital tools, this is one of the absolute superpowers, I feel, of technology in education. It can give you instantaneous feedback. If you answer a question on a digital tool, and depending on which tool you're using, depending on the way that it's set up, you can instantly get feedback. You can instantly understand whether or not you're right. If I take Evan's example of the WhatsApp messages, if his learners had gotten used to it and gotten gotten to that point, and if he had supported them to get to that point, he doesn't have to be the only one responding to the messages of the learners. They can all participate and respond to this. If we get to a point where we have, um, we, we, we our learners are comfortable to communicate, with each other because they have the confidence that they are actually getting things right through the use of instant feedback. Suddenly they become an incredibly powerful learning community. Um, Melissa, can I give an example of, of this quickly? Um, yes, you that, can, of course. <laughs> that, that I used um, when I was still teaching. I, I used to be an English home language teacher. So um, when my learners had to prepare for the writing essays, literature essays, which is always a challenging thing for kids to do. What I had them do is all of them had to write a literature essay, then submit it to an online platform. And the minute that you have submitted your essay, you then get viewing access to everyone else's essay as well. But you first need to submit your own essay before you get to see what everyone else wrote. And then I had them slowly but surely, I would assign different essays to each other. And I would not be the one necessarily um, discussing the essay, critiquing the essay, whatever you want to call it. First, when we started off with this, we would have these essays on the board. I'd put them up and I'd say, right, everyone read this essay uh, um, uh, and, and let's, let's kind of talk about it. What do you think we could improve about this essay? Where are the points that are missing in this essay? So we're doing formative assessment in the sense that they're actually getting feedback on essay writing before they have to do the formal one in the test, which is usually when they when we when when they bomb out as a teacher, I could immediately pick up Melissa's essays aren't great. We need to help her a little bit. Lyndon, best essay writer in the class, wonderful. Adele, uh, it's okay, it's not too bad. Natasha, 
wonderful enthusiasm, needs a bit of support still, but it's great. Um, but but you understand, I knew that beforehand. But the other thing that was great and that I saw happen over the years of doing this, um, when they started in grade 10, by the time they get, got to grade 12, I wasn't even commenting on anyone's essays anymore. They would post the essays and they would have five, six, seven, eight comments by different learners saying, this is great, think about this, maybe this, maybe that, think about that. Suddenly it changed the whole formative assessment game for me into a collaborative formative assessment where the class was all kind of pulling together, trying to support one another in this. But it was a process. It wasn't a case of we'll get there on day one. Same as any digital tool, same as anything we're introducing, it's a process that we're looking at. So I, I started with a process and then it kind of organically grew into a collaborative thing. But it starts with feedback and being able to give feedback quickly because that gives a learner confidence that they're on the right track or almost even almost more important gives them an indication that they're on the wrong track that they need to change what they're doing so that is a such a critical point to make it a kind of shared collaborative experience Thank you so much for that, Yaku. Well, as you were speaking, uh, you mentioned confidence quite a few times. <clears throat> and I wrote it down and getting it right. That, that's I wrote it down on my on my page over here. And that just reminded me of when I was uh, teaching as well. Um, I taught at a K-12 school and I taught grade five, six, seven. And uh, what we did was to to, to increase the learner's confidence was we had these little cards on their desks and it was either red, yellow or green. And they would then either touch the card or show me the card while I was teaching so that I could understand, OK, if they are all yellow at the moment, maybe I just need to take a step back, rework what I'm what I'm saying. If they are all on green, green means go, you move forward and you carry on. And they also had these little cards that was true and false cards to to let me know if I asked a question, how they felt about it. Um, <clears throat> and they would show me on their desk as I'm walking around and teaching and engaging with them. And they would just show me these little cards and that would just also give me an indication of how confident they were in the work at the time. And then obviously we would uh, use that to then rework the lesson plan because then we would understand as a team that this concept, the way we thought it would work, is not working. Let's all come back as a team. Let's discuss how we can uh, rephrase this or rework it as well. So yes, that whole getting it right thing. And I was also lucky enough at my school, I had an amazing learning support team. Adele, we're coming to you. Um, we had amazing uh, learning support team who, while the learners were in the class, the learners were almost never pulled out of the class for extra lessons. The learning support teachers were in the class with them and they would sit together. And of course, assessments were modified, work was modified, adjusted for them, for their specific learning um, barriers. So Adele, we are coming to you <laughs> talking about this right now. <laughs> How has technology enabled you to address the varying learning requirements of your students, especially those with special needs? And how can you guarantee that you are doing formative assessment based on um, accessibility and accommodating the, the accommodating the learner's needs? Yaku, you th thought you had a long question, did you, man? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. Um, I'm going to break it up. Um, I just feel like with, with with regards to assessment and in the special ed side of things, I taught learners with autism, Down syndrome, FAS, ADHD, ADD, you name it, you know, so, so there's no excuse to say we can't do it. I done it. It can be done. And, and one thing that was imperative for me to use for formative assessment was that I know my child. I had to know where my child is because else I would be failing the child at the end of the day. And for me, it was important that I cre create an individual support plan, which is the ISP, and work along with that, 
with the learner when doing a formative assessment so that I know I'm meeting the child where the child is at. So, Melissa, I'm going to put my camera, but can I just share something that I um, done? Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so for me, um, that is a learner with autism and assessment for learning is really incorporating every child. So that learner needs to be blocked out completely when working because he doesn't want to hear any sound. So you need to meet the learner where the learner's at. And that is what formative assessment for me is about in the special ed sphere. And, and what I come to learn about was the fact that technology was really the voice of this learners because they couldn't always express themselves on um, informative assessment ways, like a piece of paper is dead to them. Um, and that's how many children in, in mainstream fields as well, like paper is dead. So, so what are we doing to reach our learners, even mainstream um, in class? Because I taught in mainstream before I went over to special ed. And, and this is really where I saw the power of technology when I moved along. So why do I have this on in my slide? I, I believe that how do I apply this, what the WCD stands for, for every child, quality education for every child in every classroom, in every school and in the province? How do I apply this when I'm busy with formative assessment with learners with special ed? How do I make it that of quality for them? Um, and, and what I used to do was, you know, they don't always express themselves, but here's a bit of our story of how I used to do things in class. So what I would do is, um, I'm just going to be busy. I'm going to, my topic is about emotions and how I unpack that using technology. Melissa, stop me anytime. Okay. So I also used WhatsApp. So I would teach the emotions and then I would apply it. And now I would start using it in the classroom too, so that they can become familiar with it. And I would even go so far to, because I saw there was a question on foundation phase, there was, I would even have emotions on the desk when they come into the class, let's identify how you're feeling today. And, and how I would launch this was, I would take out WhatsApp and I would tell them, send your mother or father an emoticon, because I had WhatsApp groups with parents and I had the private me messages. And I would tell them, this is what we're doing this week. Um, and if you get an emoticon, a random emoticon, it is from your child. And then they would send their parent an emoticon because they could identify with that emoji um, and it's technology. And for me, it was, oh my word, this child is actually identifying how he or she is feeling. So what is stopping us in the special ed space or foundation phase space to use technology when doing assessment for all and for teaching. And then I also used um, the e-beam. Okay, so here you would see that learner has Palmer's hand where on the launch side. Um, you would see there that he's holding the, the e-beam pen with his, the, the stylus, I'm just use the correct terminology, with his whole hand. And he, his mother actually sent me a picture the other day of him holding the pencil. So, okay, what does that mean? It means that the child learned using the stylus how to hold a pencil. And our assessment is not the same as mainstream, but learning was still taking place and I was using technology. So I would always teach, the, teach with it, um, as Craig has mentioned earlier, and then I would apply it. And yeah, you can see how I actually used it in my classroom. Um, that was Kiknet at the school at the time coming to record us. And then launch was basically what the learner done. So for me, I never ever limited the child because like I said, it was the child's voice. It is the child's voice at the end of the day. And for me, um, seeing them come alive when they use technology was such an amazing space for me because I love IT, I love ICT, I can't teach without it. And I really see it as 
part of teaching. It's not like you don't say you teach with a blackboard. You just say you're a teacher. And that's how I felt um, when I started using ICT in my classroom for where it was for teaching, where it was to do formative assessment. I always built that relation with the child on where the child's at and what app I can utilize. So I used WhatsApp a lot. I used the eBeam. Um, you know, in terms of um, when having to, to do formative assessment and I've um, to see where the learners at before I'm going to assess, I would use the hide and reveal on the eBeam. So I would block out the board and I would let that learner go and find that Apple or go and find, you know, because some learners were on object level, some learners were on picture, some learners was in picture and word, and then some learners were just on the word. So I had all of that in the classroom, but even those that were worth an object, I would make sure I have that objects and then they would take that object and go match it on the board. So there's never a limitation. It's just how you think and how far you're willing to go for that learner's voice to be heard in your class. And that's just working on building on their knowledge, scaffolding, um, making sure that you're not just teaching uh, to complete the report and the assessment that you have to do, uh, Adele, for your various um, learners, yeah. but you're actually working on what they know, build, 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 and then we actually do the assessment. And as we've mentioned earlier, we're so quick to just get there to the test and the test is, is, is written, it's over. It, it, I'm talking about mainstream education. We just want to go and just finish the test and okay, it's in the mark book, the marks are submitted, let's move on. Yeah. And that's not where we need to be. And if we want to come to this learner-centered approach, we need to actually, like you say, get the child where they are at and build from there. Yaku, and Lyndon and Natasha, even if you want to jump in, now's your chance. Yaku first. Legend, um, what Adele said just made me think of something um, that I think is critical when we talk again about, about the digital integration, the use of digital tools. Some of the things that we're talking about now <clears throat> sounds like kind of high tech integration of tools and fancy stuff. And and I mean, when Craig does his thing, these are these are impressive integrations of technology, but those simple little things like what Adele mentioned now, the hide and reveal and the things like that, I mean, they they are seemingly simple, but they're incredibly powerful little tricks. One of the most effective uses of, of a digital tool for formative assessment that I actually saw in a classroom, in my opinion, was the use of um, Flippity, which was a, a, a random name picker. It sounds like a silly thing, but what, what that did immediately in the classroom the, the 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 names of the learners were all preloaded into a little wheel that spins, creates a bit of excitement, and then when it stops, there's a, a boo and a wah and a whatever. But the fact that you're doing that is every single learner is sitting up, taking notice of everything that you're saying, and is ready to respond. It's not just the keen ones who, say, who want to raise their hand and answer. It's not the guy sitting in your corner thinking, please don't pick me, please don't pick me, please don't pick me, because like he, he could be picked. That's a simple fact. This is a random name picker, and it's a simple tool. It's such a it's such a basic little thing, but that's also formative assessment. Formative assessment's not just the the fancy things. And I love the fact that Adele mentioned kind of not the 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 more advanced level of integration. Not that I'm trying to say it's not advanced, but but trying to point out that there's lots of things you can do to enhance for the assessment for learning. We keep on calling it formative assessment. And I like the assessment for learning terminology more because it feels like when we do these things and we assess for learning, it is that we're literally trying to improve learning. That is what the focus is. The focus is not marks. The focus is not anything else. The focus is learning. Learn. We want the learners yeah. to learn, which is what we should be doing. Yeah. Yes. Um, for me, uh, teaching Melissa, um, I also teach in creative arts. So there's another subject, but I'm Afrikaans, home language um, teacher. That is my um, main subject. And I'm teaching that technology, natural science, creative arts, that I sometimes do not know if I do convey and transfer the knowledge and the information correct 
to the learners. And and for me, sometimes learners are just writing down. And when you check, maybe they copied somebody else's work and you think they they are correct in what they are doing. And and then I, I used eBeam. And I have also learners in my mainstream who are supposed to be, Yalsen, they're supposed to be in another school. And they are struggling. But when I use eBeam, I gave them the, and they are eager, I gave them the opportunity to go to the board and um, then I put for technology, I use um, different kinds of illustration when I was teaching lovers. So um, that is a concept and a, con a new concept for learners to understand, but for them to understand and to apply it, I needed to know, do they get what I was teaching? And then I put it on the e-beam and I, and I allow learners to go and match the labeling to the diagrams, etc. So they did that and, and I gave everybody an opportunity and then there are learners who were struggling and when they got it incorrect, their peers um, got up and their peers um, tried to help them. But I first give them the, the opportunity to do it themselves so that they can become more confident in just getting up and raise their voice in because when they are sitting in the classroom, they are not eager to participate in answering questions. But when you use the technology, you can really see, but learners, Asian Afrikaans, but it's like you said, um, the, the, the different ways in which learners do learn um, differ from one another and, and technology brings, brings about that. So, yeah. Thank you, Lyndon. Um, Evan and Adele. I, th I think, thank you, uh, Melissa. Um, Lyndon just um, touched on that now, what I actually wanted to say, but, um, you know, mm. me teaching at the mainstream school um, and what Adele just mentioned now about, you know, um, your, your Elson learners in the mainstream, um, it's so quick to to forget about that learners. Um, and, and I think it's just something to to remember when, when integrating technology. That one should be aware. I'm just now thinking of one of my grade twelves. Um, I remember when we went to the lab and we started with 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 um, with our formative assessment. Um, you know, I just jumped into it because I assumed that you know all youngsters um, they should be able to know how to use a device, and 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 that is just now something of the uh, what Adana yeah. uh, said. I, I can relate to that, and I mean something to 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 remember. Um, when, 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 when we are integrating technology. So Adele, thank you for that. Adele, your hand is still up if you want to add anything. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Ivan. And also another, just to comment on what um, Yaku said, um, classroom screen is a powerful tool as well. Um, it's free um, and it can be used for um, like probability, time, the noise level in your class and my special ed kids like they mine i love them all um really took to that because they would be like it's going red it's going red you know they all speak like these americans um <laughs> so they will tell me um like we need to keep quiet so they could identify when they were out of of, of the zone the robot is also on the 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 probability as well um that you can teach using classrooms and it's just that these kids can relate to so much more than what we can. Um, and I think we need to give, to create that learner-centered classroom. It is so easy to do, but I think we sometimes scared of doing it because we don't know what's going to happen when we do use it. Sorry, I'm stop talking now. <laughs> I think that as teachers, we're scared of the noise because if somebody walks class, past your classroom and your classroom is noisy, why is the class always so loud? It's always loud in adults' class. They're learning. They're having fun and they are learning. We are looking at what they know and what they don't know. And how can we get from what they know and what they don't know? And it can be so many different um, methodologies that you can use to get them from what they know and what they don't know. But if we are continually checking for their understanding, um, I mentioned just a few of them, uh, the true or false. We also at my school, we had these little whiteboards where the teacher asks the question, the learners write the answer on the board, we all check. 
OK, let's move on. The next one was exit tickets. So simple. Write down the answer as you're leaving. Another one, learning stations. There's so many that we can use, but we're scared of the noise. And we have to embrace the noise because if we see children playing and laughing outside, they're learning from each other, they're, interact they're interacting with each other, but we're too scared to bring it into our classrooms because we're scared of what other people are going to say. So let your classrooms be noisy because that means your learners are learning um, maybe to a certain extent. <laughs> but let's come back to Evan quickly. He had that beautiful presentation over there. And I'm also going to ask him a difficult question um, <laughs> again. And anybody is free to jump in at this point. So Evan, what are the challenges you encountered when you were integrating technology into for um, assessment for learning? And how have you overcome them, especially in your school that had uh, limited funding and limited access to technology and resources? So, um, you know, with, with, with limited funds, um, in my experience um, at my school, I know that many schools struggle with this. Um, it's whenever you have limited funds, you know, um, it's difficult to have enough teachers um, at school and to, you know, to um, to help with 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 the workload and so now you have less periods to to really go and take time to to um in one of the challenges that that i experienced was to go and evaluate um what resources uh, are out there what digital tools can i use that's one of my challenges and it's because i have limited time to do that because so many of um my school was struggling with funds and 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 I couldn't we couldn't afford to have as many teachers that we could so you don't have enough time to 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 go and evaluate some um some tools and and I later on spoke to and this is the power of 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 sessions like today I spoke to some people and they advised me to go to the e-portal and there is this um I actually want to share this um I'm not so sure if everybody are aware of it um but we have on the e-portal um, the section that shows exactly. Can you see my screen, Melissa? Um, yes, it says e-learning brings, brings learning, learning to, to life. life. Can you or show some, us how you got there? Stuff. <laughs> yeah, you just go to, you type in um, WCED e-portal. OK, you go to the e-portal. OK, then you go to teachers. All right, and then you go to, I think it is the digital apps, tools and apps. Yes, it's that one. So and then you'll get to the section. Now, the, our colleagues at uh, our colleagues did amazing work to go and assess. So if it is that you're looking for digital content creation tools, there are quite a few things to go and, and look at, to go and explore. And I literally went through all of these things to go and see what I can use to assist me where I'm teaching it within my context. Um, what 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 can I use to enhance um, uh, assessment for learning? At school, so this was one of the solutions that 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 really that really helped me a lot. A uh, solution there was was to speak to my speak to my to my e-learning advisors, speak to people in the industry, you know, networking and building relationships, attending sessions like today, um, to pick up on 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 things that that other people are doing at their schools and see how I can integrate that. Um, at, at at my school, see what can work, um, what might not be able, what might not work at this stage where I'm at, um, and and those are the things that that really helped me, um, to overcome those those challenges. Thank you so much for that, Evan. And uh, the reason why we asked that question is because as e-learning advisors, we go to schools and we hear that what you are going through as teachers, and we understand that there are lots of challenges at your schools. And just by 
going and looking at the e-portal, you will be able to find lots of resources that you can use in your classroom. You can use, uh, besides the lesson plans, there are, there's a plethora of resources available there for you. And if you go to that page that Evan was just showing, uh, the list of digital tools, you will find one that you can use in your class for formative assessment. Something simple as the e-beam, as um, Adele was talking about earlier. Something simple as uh, using a piece of paper as an exit ticket. It doesn't always have to be digital. It can be something that at least just shows that your learner understands what's happening in the classroom, that they're not lost. We don't want any more lost boys and lost girls in South Africa. We are talking about getting everybody back on track. We don't want them lost anymore. <laughs> OK, so we're going to start checking for understanding. We're going to start checking for assessment for learning. I see Natasha's hands up. Yaku, are you ready to share with us a very um, uh, a, a simple tool that we all know that we've been using in this session. We've I've posted it a few times. Are you ready on your side, Yaku? While Natasha just uh, gives us some input. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Just a, a comment on this thing of being under resourced. Um, you know, often for for us at our school, it was a matter of, well, we are quintile five school, we should be a quintile one, we're not getting fees, the finances is a major issue. And if a computer breaks, well, there goes that. There's no money to fix it, there's no money to replace it. And it's it's easy to go, oh, you know, there goes that again. But one of the, the things, I mean, I was doing some coding and robotics, um, and constantly the thing that came up about 21st century skill is this thing called collaboration. And I think that when we look at our circumstances where we find ourselves to be under-resourced, we forget that, you know, if, if I think of a computer lab where all the computers are working and each child gets to work at a computer. For some kids, well, certainly at our school, that can be overwhelming. But put two kids at one computer, and that might be a bit easier because they might not feel as overwhelmed. I don't know what button to push, where to go, because now they work together. You know, so there's that confidence. Um, and so we have found that under resource doesn't always, isn't always a bad thing. You know, look at the bright side of it, collaboration. Even if you have two or, th or three or four of them sitting there, they will realize together, hey, we can manage this without the teacher um, having to, you know, hover over us. And also kids get excited when they did it. Miss, I found it, you know. Um, and so I just want to encourage the colleagues that, Again, under-resourced is not always a bad thing. We have enough things to depress us. A, a collaboration, collaboration is a 21st century skill. Um, and, and kids sometimes struggle to work with each other. And so it can be really good teaching moments as well. So I just wanted to quickly share that comment. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for that, Natasha. And we find that at our schools, as Lyndon was talking about earlier, green shoots, we go into schools that have 20 PCs and only 14 of them are working, but there's 50 learners in the classroom. All of them are working together, completing their task. They put their names in at the end, their usernames in at the end. They've all worked together. And they're building their knowledge on what the teacher taught in the classroom. Now they're applying it in the computer lab and then we go back and it's the cycle, this routine and and it seems to be working. One of our colleagues at uh, Overberg, Mr. Louis van Amerwe, showed us that Green Shoots is having a positive effect on the learners in their classrooms. So that is another tool if you're not aware of it yet. Uh, where have you been? Um, it is for primary school, grade three to seven um, learners. If you don't know anything about it, it's called Green Shoots. Please contact your e-learning advisor. It's for mathematics. It is amazing. And there's a pilot happening in Winelands for Intercent, not Intercent, for Senior Phase, um, mm. which will be hopefully rolled out, hopefully, 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 <laughs> for Senior Phase. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Yaku, would you like to fall in here, please? Right. Thank you, Melissa. I'm going to share my screen quickly to just show you this because by now everyone has filled in hundreds and hundreds of these Google Forms, I'm sure. You 
filled in a Google form to indicate that you want to join the session. You filled in a Google form now to indicate that you are in the session. And I'm sure you filled out many, many, many other Google forms before. Now, these things are incredibly easy to set up, which is why everyone is using it to collect data and information. But there's a simple little switch that you can do with any Google form that turns it into a quiz where you take these questions that you set up and you just turn them into a quiz. So I've actually here got the world's most basic quiz ever. There are two questions. You'll see my first question is how cool is digitizing formative assessment? Um, and you've got three options. So I'm going to say it is so amazing. And then my second question, when it says, do you want to learn more about formative assessment? Um, well, just because I want to show you that what happens when you get it wrong, I will choose the wrong option, which is no. Of course, no is the wrong option. And I'm going to say no. So I filled in my two questions. I submit it. And here for me is the real magic of where these things come in. And this is the one that is often overlooked. There is a very important little button over here that says view score. Now, it depends on how you set these things up, of course. Um, if, if you set it up that they can't view the score, that it needs to be released later. But for me, this is one of the most valuable things. Remember, I spoke about that instant feedback. As a learner, I can now immediately know, without having to wait for my teacher to tell me, I can click on my view score and I will see what did I, how did I do. So this was a 100 mark quiz, only two questions, both count 50 marks. The first one I got right. The second one, when I got it wrong, I actually added a little feedback in here that tells the learner why they got it wrong. So the critical thing is, theoretically, what you could do is if you completed a lesson, if you completed a module, at whatever point you want to, you can set these up so that learners can answer the questions. And it basically does two things for you. On the one hand, it gives the learner instant feedback. So yeah, the learner can see what's happening, right? I'm not going to try to write, am I going to fit it in? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, right? you can. Good job. <laughs> learner, I fit it in. So the learner sees what's going on. But very importantly, on the next tab, you'll see here, I, as the teacher, I also get to see what's going on. So I can see there are two responses that have happened, and I can immediately have a view of how they answer the questions, my learners. Now, this one has been set up that it didn't require them to enter a name. It's not capturing an email address or anything. So there's no identifier as to who did what. So I want to show you just a real example of this quickly. This is a real example of it. So we have the digital skills course that, that is something that's running out. Some of you might have attended it. Hopefully all of you will attend it one day once we have more of them running out. But here I get a breakdown, a very quick breakdown of the marks that have been achieved for this thing. Remember, I have not touched a red pen for any of this. I did not need to go flip through pages. This happens instantly. You saw how quickly that, that response that I wrote pulled through to this thing. It is instant. Now, if I scroll down, this is where it gets incredibly useful for me is here I actually get to see where the learners are missing the point, which is what the whole idea is of this formative assessment thing, is to know where they're getting it wrong. If I am teaching learners about figures of speech, and I have a small assessment like this, and I see almost all of them are getting the, the questions on metaphors wrong, it doesn't make sense for me to go on to the next thing. Then clearly they're missing what metaphors are about. Regardless of what CAP says I'm supposed to do, regardless of those pressures, it doesn't help if you continue teaching concepts that build on other concepts if the building blocks aren't there. It just doesn't help. So that's a fundamental thing. So by using this, I immediately know where the issues are. What I also immediately know is if I look at this, there are two kids in the class that are doing wonderfully well. No issues, do not need to struggle, with, do not need to look at them. But they, someone is getting, is not even getting 50% for this thing. So if I bring in that concept of collaborative learning, I can get these kids to start playing a role in these kids. Because I now know before the test, the actual formal test is happening. The other thing that's great, 
about this thing that I also very much promote is the idea of being able to complete these forms more than once. So you get it, you complete it once, you get 15 out of 30. Clearly, you need to go back to the work. Go through the work, see what you got wrong, understand, try and re-understand or rework through those things. Do it again. Now you're getting 30 out of 30. That changes the whole teaching dynamic, the way that we're going through things. And of course, I'm not going to go into more detail with this, but you can, of course, do a question by question analysis. So I can only look at one question, which year did Google Classroom start? And I can see that the majority of them said 2014, which is the correct answer. Um, and so forth and so forth. Here I can see other answers that people, that learners gave. And I can also go into the individual. So here I'll have a look at this individual's answers and I can go one by one and check what happened with these individuals. So it gives me all of that scope. Um, but the bottom line is, this is a incredibly good and useful entryway into, into formative assessment, and it can change your entire teaching practice the way that you go about doing it. The bad news is Google Forms is not part of our four-piece webinar series. So unfortunately, if you're super curious, I'm not going to show you how to do any of this. I gave you a sneak peek. The bad news is it's not part of the of, of the formative series. The good news is Melissa has asked one of her transformation agents, JC, um, I think JC is in the, I think I saw his name, he is with us. He's going to be presenting a session on the 29th, if I'm not mistaken, Melissa, right? So I'm going to add that little link in the chat. We'll talk about that again at the end of the session, which is rapidly approaching, so we need to get to that. So if you are curious about how to set up your own Google quiz, your own Google form, how to do those things. If you filled in hundreds of these things and you think to yourself, hey, I wonder how to do my own, um, then in that session, JC will show you how to set up a normal Google form. He'll show you how to change it into a quiz. He'll mm -hmm. show you all the kind of fancy stuff that I did now in 10 minutes. He's just going to spend an hour and a half going through all the nuts and bolts of the thing. So if you're interested in that, there's the link. You can click on that. You can pre-register for it. I'll post that link at the end of the session again. Not sharing. I, I I was just thinking of um Yako that um GimKit and um there's one part in GimKit that is um Kit Collab, but the free version don't don't give you that. So I need to go back to my school and somehow convince them to buy um GimKit so that I can have access. And that looks like a great thing for learners to explore. Um, without that, um, it's just a normal quiz thingy, uh, GimKit, but um, on the 11th, I will go through GimKit, so it, it, it is nice. This morning, um, I took the tablets to, to, to my classes, and when they saw the word GimKit, the learners got excited um, because they know now, because there's lots of games, um, collaborative games that you can use in, in that, um, yeah, and and one of the things me and my child we played with that where you have to feast and um we played at home with that thingy and the critical thinking of that comes into play where you have to um sort out things for yourself so 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 that game kid no how i'm a guy i like to play games i i grew up with um that arcade games so for for people who love to play games that kind of gamification it is great to have in your class, especially for me. I was always thinking of what, how can I, what can I use for Afrikaans except the normal traditional? And then I got introduced to uh, GimKit, and and now I can um, because we have to write every second week uh, a bi-weekly um, test, informal, just to check if our learners are, are up to where they have to be. And I thought it uh, best now to um, use GimKit and because GimKit um, gives you immediate feedback. It gives you data. So you, like Yaku said there, you can go back, you can see it gives you the scores and you can see um, with what concepts learners struggle with. So that thing is, is, is for me a nice thing to have um, fully paid. Um, the, the and whole. you will be doing the presentation on GimKit for us later as part of the series. So good marketing for yourself there, Lyndon. <laughs> Thank you. Colleagues, I'll take I, the blame. It's OK. <laughs> Yaku has um, shared the link with you. So if you type in um, classroom screen, 
and you can use that link. Um, you will see this is how it looks and then you just try it for free. You can get an account if you want to, but I think we have so many free accounts everywhere that we don't want another account. So this is how classroom screen looks colleagues. So as I said earlier, you can, this is a nice friendly theme, friendly theme, so you can make it bigger. So it fits the whole screen, so this will be on your board. And there's options that you can change the background. Um, if you want to upload a background, you're more than welcome to do so as well. You have that option to do that. And there's a nice um, thing that so if you you can see this is all that you have available. OK, so what I used to do was I used to write a text and then I would say what subject it is. OK, so if you don't want this, you just click on delete and it takes it away. And like I said earlier, the traffic light, you could also say you could use it. You can say, OK, maybe now, you know, if you have the concept of a traffic light, you can say no talking now. We are busy working. And then if you want to give them some free time, then you're more than well, you can decide how you want to use it. But the nice thing is the learners see it the whole time. And then um, in special ed, we are, we use Makaton. So here you will see this. But I mean, you can also use it in mainstream. There's silence and then whispering. And now you can talk to your friend. So these are all symbols that you can put up in the classroom. And then when you're working together, when you're incorporating that collaboration and you can move it around where you want it and you can make it bigger should you need to, um, depending on what you want. Then there's also the sound level. So I don't think it's going to work now. Let's see. Okay, it is working because I'm talking. So this is what the kids loved. So if you're talking too loud in the class, you know, it would go very loud and the kids would get upset because they're not supposed to be talking. So you try and so you can have this up and then you can have the work symbol of whisper. I'll ask your neighbor and then you can control the noise level in your classroom so that when people walk past your classroom, it's not that loud. <laughs> Thank you, Adele. Okay. Okay. Yay! Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, so, so I'm, this is a format that I set up literally where I've just used um, questions that are available in the free version. So I'm going to go to preview just so that people can see what what it looks like. So you know we can we can preview it either on a, on a you know on a, a computer or a tablet or a phone. Um, so I'm just going to show quickly what it would look like. For example, if uh, we're looking at at it on a um, like a laptop or something. So. I would have loved for us to to actually do the for you guys to do this um, this this worksheet so that you could see the responses in real time. But I, I realize we're going to run out of time, so this is what it looks like. Okay, so this, these are all on the free version. So we've got some true false questions. We've got multiple choice questions. You can drop in images. So I've created a multiple choice question where you know the image is the basis, and then we've got multiple choice over there. Now remember that as learners are answering these questions i can see in real time exactly what you know what is happening each person that's answering and so on um here's another variation of a multiple choice question that i made then you've got multiple answer okay so you know you can you can um choose more than one correct statement what's nice is is the learners can sort of cross they can cross things out if you know, by elimination so they can go, no, it's not that one, it's not that one. Okay, so that, that's quite a nice feature of it. And um, also what's nice about this is it takes up the entire screen. You know, with, with, with a Google form, for example, it's kind of, you know, squashed into the middle of the screen, whereas this really does kind of take up the whole screen, which is very nice. As you can see, open-ended questions as well. In this case, why do people take the stairs instead of the lift? You could have a whole lot of different answers that potentially could be correct, and you can mark them all in one fell swoop, which is amazing. You can have 95 learners answer this question in different ways, but they could all be correct, and you can mark them all as correct immediately. You can get people to, to draw something. Uh, I've said, yeah, I purposely spelt the word picture incorrectly, 
because if I was if we had more time and I could give you a demo while you're working and answering the questions I can actually fix things in the background so you know a learner can say oh so you spelled what does picture mean and I could go oh, sorry you know I spelt it incorrectly and I can fix it while while they're working I can add more questions to this while they're working um, there's space for them to draw to to draw something okay another open-ended question remember this is all the free version we're looking at you can drop in a video and then you can, you know, you can ask a few questions on the video. They've made this more sophisticated as well. You can, for example, drop in a screenshot of a picture or piece of text or whatever, and you can drop in your questions exactly where you want them to be. So you don't need to go, that's paragraph one, that's paragraph two, that's paragraph three, et cetera. You can just drop the question off exactly where you want the question to appear on, on the, the worksheet. Um, I made my own kind of uh, column A, column B thing. This, the, the paid for version has got a very nice um, matching column function, but uh, on the free version it doesn't. So, you know, I, I just figured out a way to, to, to get around the problem. And then again, you know, an open-ended question, Joe's visiting Paris on issues in budget, suggest how I can make his money go further. Again, you'll have, you know, a hundred different answers that could all be correct. And with this, you can actually mark it all in one fell swoop, which is, is fantastic. But what I'm going to show quickly is this. Um, so hopefully one or two people can just, even if we don't finish it, hopefully one or two people can actually um, do this activity just so that people can, can see what, how powerful this is for feedback. So what I do a lot in my class is I, is I do a formative where I do it as a teacher-paced activity. So what this means is that I actually drip one question at a time to, to the class, all right? So in this case, if I go assign, I'm going to go, right, I want this to be a teacher-paced activity. Who do I want to send it to? Well, obviously, I would send it. I've got formative hooked up to my Google Classroom, so I could select a class, which is easy. But you guys are all guest students, so I'm going to go paste guest students. So now, if we can maybe have, you know, even if it's just two or three people, you can do this on your phone, because I just want for everybody to see on screen what it means to be getting real-time feedback. So for any of you, um, you can literally, you can just take your phone. If you've got an iPhone, you can literally just grab that QR code, or if you've got some other sort of phone, you know, use, use your QR code reader, and that will take you to goformative.com forward slash join. It will ask you to enter a code. So in this case, L4G4K4. And um, yeah, so it'll be great if we can get one or two people. So guys, I'm going to ask that even, so you, you can see what's on my screen. So I'd like, I'd like, five people maybe to join. I don't mind how many people join, but once we've got five people, then I'm going to start because the whole point is I want you to see what the- We've got three people is. so far. Three people. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So there's a lot of people. So basically what- I'm There we go. Do, okay. That's enough. Okay. So I'm going to go start now. All right. Okay, so what will happen now is that I drip feed the questions to people, to, to my class one at a time, okay? So there's the first question, all right? So now I've just explained something to all of you, and I want to check if you know what's going on. And so I want you to answer now. Over here, it's actually showing me how many people have responded. Five people have responded so far, etc. Now, on my side, I can actually view all the responses coming through, Okay. So I can view the responses as total. So I can see, look at all these people have got it right. Okay. So no problem. They were listening in class. That's excellent. I'm happy about that. These, these people over here, I don't know, they weren't listening or they didn't understand. So I'm going to have to maybe just um, go back. Now, the other nice thing is, you know, if, I, I don't want to embarrass the class. So what I can do is on my settings, I can just change this to hide the student names. Okay. But the learners are not actually seeing this. I'm the one seeing this. And, and I'm using this real-time feedback to know whether I need to re-explain the concept or not. Okay. So 
I'm quite happy with that. People seem to know their work and I can actually move on now. So I'm gonna push you on to the next question. So the next question, and by the way, I'm assuming that a lot of you are actually doing this on your cell phone, all right? So um, I've got four respondents, five respondents, six respondents. So I know I've got 20 people in the class. Once this number over here gets to 20, I know that I can go and have a quick look now at my um, dashboard and I can say, okay, all right. There are a lot of people who are not getting question two right. So I know that before we move on to question three, I'm going to have to just quickly re-explain this step of the sum. Okay, because I've got a lot of red coming through here. And um, yeah, obviously those people need some help. Um I just want to emphasize that something that, that I know in talking to Craig about it, um, because he can really go on for hours on formative. I know that, but the the one thing the one thing that that I think he kind of brushed over that is absolutely critical is your learners do not need computers. Your learners do not need tablets. You need cell phones. And I know this is something that that one of the schools, one of the rural schools in in our area did is they they had a cell phone drive. They collected old cell phones. Um, so that they could use these old cell phones for exactly things like that, using formative in the classroom, using GimKit, which Lyndon is going to show you. The, the reason why I put that poll up there, I just want to quickly say that, Melissa, um, before I get back to you, is formative is unfortunately, like Google Forms, not part of the webinar series. However, can I go on to kind of advertise the other stuff quickly, Melissa, or do you want of to wrap course, up the session? No, first? you may first advertise. <laughs> Thank you. However, if you do find what Craig is talking about quite interesting, Craig will be presenting a session on another tool that he's really fond of called Quizlet, right? So Craig uses Quizlet also a lot. I know he uses formative more, I think, than Quizlet, but Quizlet is another great tool that he's going to be presenting on. Um, so if I can just, I'm just going to share my screen very quickly um, just to kind of talk about the... These things, if you haven't gone onto the site yet, um, you'll notice that we are, this is our first session, Introducing Digital Assessment for Learning. Our second session, which is next week, next week on Monday and on Wednesday, the session is repeated at three o'clock. I will be hosting a session where we look at low-tech solutions, where you can digitize assessment and the only thing you need is your own cell phone. You do not need any learner devices whatsoever for these solutions. So very interesting options, especially for our schools that don't have a lot of technology. And then in the following week, we do a Quizlet session where Craig is going to take you through how we can use Quizlet for content consolidation, but also a lot more than just that. Very, very cool tool. Same time, it's also going to be on a Monday and a Wednesday at three o'clock. And then the last session, which is going to be presented by Lyndon, he will take you through GimKit, which again, formative uh, the assessment for learning tool that integrates more gamification. This is probably my favorite tool I've discovered in the past two years. I absolutely love Gim GimKit. I think it is a phenomenal tool. My kids would be fishing that it comes out of the ears if I was still in the classroom. I think it's a wonderful tool. But the bottom line is there's lots of great tools out there. There really are. And we want to, this session was just a discussion talking about these tools. The next three sessions, we're going to dive into these tools and explain to you how you use them. And one of the cool things is the minute that you start kind of getting the grip of one of them, it's not that hard to start using more, to start using other ones without overwhelming your learners. Right. So that was the one thing I wanted to say. I really hope we see you in the next three sessions as well. So if you just, if you completely forget, just remember for the next four weeks, every Wednesday at three o'clock, we're going to have sessions. And then on Mondays at three o'clock as well, we're going to have sessions. Um, if you haven't pre-registered, I hope you do. We'll send the pre-registration for that along with this form, um, with this one as well. That's the last from me. We are kind of already over our time. Melissa, I'm going to hand back to you because I am now taking over. This is technically your panel discussion. So please, Melissa, thank you very much to the other <laughs> panelists. I really enjoyed our conversations. I'm very used to you taking over, Yaku, so that's perfectly fine. So, yay, I see everybody had a good time. I'm so excited you stayed an extra six minutes. So thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, 
I want to say thank you to our panelists. Miss Adele Smith is not here at the moment. She just had to jump off as she is a very busy um, inclusive education coordinator. Uh, but I just want to say thank you to Mr. Lyndon, Miss Natasha, Mr. Evan, and Mr. Craig, and Mr. Yaku for everything that you have shared with us today, from WhatsApp to GimKit, formative, the little microscope I can put in my pocket. I mean, that's just amazing. It really, really is. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time, colleagues. I hope you've taken something away from this. Uh, uh, then we were supposed to end. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy your evening, and I hope you don't get caught in the load shedding. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.